This is Mont Talk Tour take number two. This is the second in the series of videotapes from Preston Nichols. This tape is copyrighted 1994, Preston B. Nichols, East Islip, New York. Preston Nichols, author of the Montauk Project and the other Montauk Project books. Welcome to Montauk Tour number two. As we have released Montauk Tour number one, there was stuff we could not fit on Montauk Tour number one, so we're including it on Montauk Tour number two. Also, we've added other stuff for your enjoyment, which is interest that parallels the Montauk Project. We will start out tonight by taking you out to Montauk and showing you slow motion, frame by frame analysis of the shots taken from the roof of the radar tower of Junior, which is the beast that crashed the Montauk project. Then from there we're going to take it and show you the hidden security guards that are on the base, which was caught at the time of the Montauk tour. We'll also show you the helicopters, the black copters that fly around and report and right after you see a black copter when you're on the base, you then get accosted by the State Park Police. Then we will take you here to Space Time Labs and show you the zero time reference generator as designed by Nikola Tesla. Then we go out to Montauk in 1993 for their St. Patty's Day Parade. This is included to show you how bizarre the people in this town really are. Then we'll go and look at the two receivers, the RCA receivers that were the same design used in the Montauk chair at Montauk and the FRR-24 as gotten from uh, Dr. Van Neumann, upstate New York. Okay, here we have the slow motion analysis of Junior as seen from the roof of the radar tower as shown in Montauk Tour number one. We've slowed down the action here. The right hand side of the screen has 2.32 p.m. 1.293. Junior is on the cement structure that's white in the middle of the picture right over 2.32 right now. You'll see this black speck that sort of looks humanoid, maybe, who knows. But if you watch carefully, it moves. Each jump is a frame. Now Junior's about at the middle of the screen, about two thirds of the way up from the bottom. He's right over the round thing at the bottom of the screen. This is an etheric image when the transmitter was shut off. This image sort of stuck around in the energy fields of Montauk. It's not seen physically, but it's picked up by cameras or video cameras. Again, now on the mid right hand screen. And in this case, you'll actually see him walk up and down the hill. You'll see him crouch over a little bit. This, of course, is the second pass, and this has much more activity of Junior in it. Junior right now is over the black thing at the edge of the building, over the white cement structure with the semicircle thing sticking out the front of it, in the mound that's off the corner of the roof of the radar tower. A lot of people do not have good slow motion analysis on their videotape machines, so we're doing this. So you can sit and make up your own mind whether we're looking at something real or we're looking at an artifact due to the optics of the equipment and the video. Either way, it's very interesting as nothing else in the picture is moving.
this is pretty interesting as this is suggesting we have a thought form left over which came out of the transmitter from the old Montauk project. This is covered in book number one, Why Junior Appeared, and was used to trash the project at the end of the project. Now we're looking at one of the black copters, which is used as security, we believe. These are all black with no writing. The reason we say this is security is because after one of these copters flies over and spots a group of people, about 10 minutes later, cops show up to either kick you off the base or to write you a ticket or to arrest you. We believe they have some sort of intrusion detector, brings out people in this copter to see what's going on, then they report and the cop comes out and does his job. Now we're walking in from the east gate. As we came around from the gate, we were rounding the corner, so to speak. In the right hand corner of the picture, as we go down, you will see the image of a man standing there. We don't see him yet. Some people see crosses in the weeds. Now if you look carefully, you'll see a man standing there. His arms are moving, and he's moving quite fast. Now he's quite visible. We believe this fellow has an invisibility man pack that he has on his person. He pushes a button. Now you see a smear going diagonally. He's now about a third from the right edge and a third up from the bottom. As the smear gets brighter and more defined, the man fades out. He's standing in front of a tree that sort of resembles a man. This is the problem with this video. And some people see a cross in the weeds on the left side of the picture. See, as this fella turns on his invisibility pack, it creates a field that makes a distortion in space-time. And that's that sort of dark area, that dark smear we see across the person. You can see an outline of the head just to the right of the tree. You can sort of see a fuzzy outline of the body in front of the tree as this person fades out. He's just about gone now. All's left is that odd shaped tree. We see the smear is now turning into an X with bent cross arms on it. Again, we're presenting this in very slow frame by frame motion so you can really look at it and make up your own mind. We wish you here to make up your own mind. Look at it yourself. Don't believe what I'm saying. Take what I'm saying and look at it. Make up your own mind. Believe it if you wish. If you don't wish to believe it, don't matter. 
Now here we're looking at the main gate of the base. We see the platform of the tower behind the uh, security building. We see antennas on that platform. There's also cameras that look all around the base. This is part of the security of the base. As we pan to the right of the screen, we will see coming in the view the old gate that was on the facility many years ago on 1-2-93, January 2nd, 93. Now we can start to see the gate itself appear. You can see the stop sign on the gate. You can see this is just a regular swing open gate with a chain with a padlock around it. On the Montauk Tour 1, we show you the guardhouse and the brand new transformer. Now we're looking at the new gate, which appeared in 1994. Here we see it's electrically operated gate by that rectangular thing behind the gate. You see the chain that moves the gate over. The question is, what is a state park doing with a gate this sophisticated? This is the type of gate you see in a high security facility. Although if you walk this fence, you'll find many holes in the fence. But if you're caught in here, you get all sorts of hell rays. You see, property of the state of New York. In 668-2461, that is the phone number for the Long Island State Park Commission. Here we're looking at the combination lock that's used to open the gate. Highly sophisticated, isn't it, folks? For a state park. Now we're looking at the control and the combination lock on the other side. Even if you get in this place, you have trouble getting out. Now we're looking at the no trespassing signs on the outer part of the base, which used to be open. It says no trespassing for any purpose whatsoever. New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Restricted area. That is very final. Here we're looking okay, at... Here we have the zero time reference generator as designed by Nikola Tesla, although this one was built in the 50s. It's a motor generator type signal unit, and what we'll do is we'll zoom in on it. You can see how the thing is made. You can see it has a phase angle meter, the window, that measures phase angle. And as we run it, you can see it tunes. This rotates one set of generators with respect to the other set of generators. We can take a look at the front panel of this unit. It has a group of outputs. We can see what it puts out. You can see a master attenuator, specific signal selector. We can see what it selects. It has an output meter. It has a function selector. There's the phase angle selector. And it has this curious tone localizer. This is used for VOR work. This is old style aircraft navigation. Then we can see if we go down below there, we got a whole little door with all sorts of other calibrations and potentiometers in there. This is the instrument as mentioned in the Montauk project number one. 
which references to zero time through inertially resonating now, to the center of the galaxy. Now, the top view of the uh, Tesla zero time reference generator. Here we can see the motor. As we see, it can spin. It drives a generator here, and there's another generator in here. This gear is what the angle, phase angle dial right below operated. As, we, as you can see, we can tune it. And we can turn this generator right here. You can see that one turn with respect to the other generator here. We also have a secondary generator here, motor and generator, motor running capacitors, networks down here. And we can fire it up. Now, as this thing turns on and fires up, you'll notice it goes up a bit, and then it goes up, and then it always shoots and it settles into frequency. They are just hunted. You can see one generator. You can see it's marked a thousand cycle generator. You can see the gear right here. We can see the frequency pick off. This is the motor. Now, we can see here spinning away this big wheel. With its pickup magnet coil. That's right here. This one's generating 10 kilohertz. And then we can see the two 30 hertz generators, this one and this one. Two minutes for you. You'll be able to feel the waves come off this thing and come through the TV screen.
here we have the Montauk St. Patty's Day Parade in 1993. We're showing you this parade because some of the floats in it are quite amusing and quite bizarre. What you'll note here is that the floats, the bizarreness, represents the effect of the mind control transmissions on the townspeople of Montauk. We don't know what this is. It's been suggested it may be a vertebrae. We don't know, but whatever it is, it's pretty bizarre, folks. You see, we got here a bunch of people supposedly having a good time, but they stand around like mannequins. Usually people move around, have a good time, they're cheering. Of course, we have the bands. Usually people will move with the bands, will gesticulate with the bands. Here, these people are sort of just fixed. They don't appear to move that much. This is peculiar behavior on the folks watching the parade. They can seem less interested. Now here we have a truck pulling a flatbed with a van on it that says Abduls. The peculiar thing is on the back of the truck is a green outhouse like used in a construction site. Why do they have an outhouse going down the main street of Montauk on St. Patty's Day? That's pretty bizarre, folks. Isn't that bizarre? Now we have a honey truck pulling a flatbed with a precast cesspool on it. And it says on the truck, the grass is always greener over the septic tank. What are they insinuating? That Montauk is a cesspool? Is that the message here? And that everything started in a mess in a cesspool, even with the rainbow coming out of the cesspool? Nobody knows what this thing is. It has motion in it, but that's all you can say for it. Is this the Montauk's people's rendition of the monster of the Montauk project? Who really knows? At best, it's bizarre, folks. Now here, the folks are poking fun at the Army Corps of Engineers because they were in process in 1993 of rebuilding, shoring up the point that had the lighthouse on it. This shows the town's contempt for the government and the military. Of course, if you've just been mentally raped by the Montauk Project, you feel contempt for this subconsciously also. Remember, subconscious desires come out in parades and activities like this. Now here we have the new house I just bought with the proceeds from the three books and the videotapes. Well actually, if you believe that, I got in my pocket a deed for a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell you. Actually, this is a Montauk Manor which was built a long time ago in the 20s when they were making Montauk into a posh settlement. Here we have the FRR 24 radio receivers as talked of in the book The Montauk Project. These these receivers came from Dr. Von Neumann, who lives upstate New York. He told me of some of the bizarre things these sets receive. These sets were actually designed by Dr. Von Neumann in the national company James Millen and uh, T. Henry Moray. These receivers were sent back in time. Here we're looking at the front end of the FRR-24 radio receiver. Here we have the pre-selector. On this we have the three RF amplifiers, a mixer. Now over here we have the local oscillator which is built like an old frequency meter. Then we have a buffer, a tuned buffer for the oscillator. They wanted stability in this receiver without synthesizing it. 
Here we're looking at the silver tuning capacitor. Each plate is a very thin steel plate with a thick coating of silver on a bronze shaft coated with silver. When you tighten up the screws to drive the shaft, they gore themselves out and you have to keep retightening the screws. That's how soft the silver is. It has five sections of the tuning capacitor, couples to the coils. Here we're looking at the five coils. They're the round things that are white. Here they're sort of grayish. Right there, there's the four or five coils. We have five individual compartments here. Over here we have the IF transformer that drives the first IF. Here we're looking at one of the coils close up. We see the silver wire with the tarnish on the wire. Here we have the first IF which is 1750 kilohertz. These sets use the activity of silver and superconducting aluminum to couple through the time function. Here we're looking at the actual first IF, all the IF transformers. Here we're looking at the underneath. Now the shielded compartment is the local oscillator mixer that converts down to 50 kilohertz for the second IF. Here we're looking at the striations from the aluminum, which is microchannel aluminum, like George Merkel developed using a mercury process. Dr. von Neumann warned me about getting mercury poisoning off the chassis. If you look at this chassis, it has microchannels that conduct electrons through a tunneling effect. Here we're looking at the IF bandpass filter. This is the first chassis in the 50 KC IF system. What's interesting to note is the pitting in the aluminum on the front panel, but inside the chassis Inside, it's pretty, pristine, clean. Doesn't look like it's been touched by anything. This suggests what kind of aluminum is inside compared to outside. The aluminum inside is impervious. This is not standard aluminum. Aluminum will rot. These boxes are not at all sealed, so the dampness gets inside that was on the outside of it as well. Here we're looking at the second chassis. This is the actual IF amplifier for the second IF at 50 kilohertz. Here we're looking at the bottom of the second IF amplifier. Here we're looking at the top of the second IF amplifier. Here we're looking at the AF detector chassis. They had three chassis in this 50 kilohertz IF system. This was one of the world's most complex radio receivers with 100 tubes and a 90 pound power supply to run all this. This thing sat in a the rack. They had four separate front ends. They didn't gang the coils. They didn't band switch the coils. They actually band switched the entire front end assembly. They left nothing out of the design of this. This was a super duper design of the late 40s, early 50s for a communications receiver. This operated at 2 to 30 megahertz. Here we're looking at the RCA 1935 receiver, which Nikola Tesla designed when he worked for Marconi and RCA, based upon the receiver we just saw sent back through time. As we can see, this is a very old receiver. Again, total redundancy. Three separate front ends, three separate set, three separate tuning capacitors, three separate sets of tubes. This part here was originally a TRF regenerative set built by Nikola Tesla for Marconi. Now RCA took over Marconi and made the regenerative detector and buffer into a mixer oscillator for a superheterodyne. They did this because RCA owned the patents for the superhet. We can see this is telco type construction. This was part of the RCA network. Now we're looking at the IF section. This was part of the network that RCA used to communicate overseas, was called RCA Communications. They used these radios to receive ships at sea. Old timers
receivers would tell me that these receivers would pick up signals when the modern receivers wouldn't. And they used these up until the 70s when they shut down the facility. These radios were turned on in 1935 and the tubes rarely had to be replaced and they were run 24 hours a day. This thing once again was over design. This was state of the art of the 30s. But the circuit in the block diagram is so similar, I would have said this set inspired the FRR24. But I'm told it's the other way around by a number of sources. And a number of psychics have picked up Nikola Tesla's vibes and patterns on these receivers. And he worked as Nikola Turbo at RCA. And he worked at Rocky Point Riverhead in their communications facility since his nephew was the vice president of RCA in charge of RCA Communications Inc. He was looking at the antenna coupling. They actually used coils that separated and would go at right angles to control the coupling from the antenna into the antenna tank. Here we see the closed. Now we're looking at the RF amplifiers. Those rectangular things with wax, those are Faradon capacitors. They're made in Britain. The fact that these front end assemblies full of British capacitors suggests it was made by a British company. Here we're looking at four screws that hold on the big can on the other side of the chassis that has a tank coil. These three coils couple to the tank coil through the tube that the tank coil active, acts with. The three coils are in the grid and the cathode bypass and couples to the plate. Now we can see each group of three coils coupling into its tank coil. It's believed that this forms a three-sided pyramid structure with the tank coil, with the base being towards us and the peak being at the tank coil. Here we're looking at the local oscillator mixer section. Here we're looking at the three groups of coils placed under the oscillator coil connected to the mixer tube. We have quantum coupling from the oscillator as well as electrical coupling. The mixer is up to the top of the screen and the oscillator is at the bottom of the screen. We also have the filament bypass chokes. Here we're looking at the bypass network made up of big oil fill capacitors and big audio style chokes. These chokes are made by Ferranti of Britain. If you look at this thing, it appears that this thing uses a lot of British parts. This backs up the idea that this original design was a receiver made for American Marconi, which of course is a British company. Now the IF section has all American made parts in it. This was designed later by Nikola Tesla when it became RCA. Again here, we have four screws which hold on the IEF transformer cans that contain the two tank coils. Again, we got three coils that form a, a three-sided pyramidal structure that resonate through the chassis with each tube that this structure is around. This is the delta T structure that replaces the activity of the delta T antenna. This is why this receiver was picked for the chair where they use Helmholtz coils to shield the outside signals. The original design used standard receivers with a delta T antenna structure. This receiver picks up an actual time wave that comes in through time. Here we're looking at the tank coils that are in the cans that are above the chassis and an IF transformer. Note that the coils for the IF transformers are right angles to each other. They can be made closer or further apart and there's no coupling capacitors. This receiver is highly over designed. Okay, now you've seen some leftover material from the Montauk tour. We're now going to go and provide you with proof 
that the Montauk base was still operating in 1993 and signs of activity up until present day. We'll start by going out to the road behind the base, south of the base, which you walk in through to get to the south entrance. You walk over a stream. There are two pipes sticking up out of the ground by the stream. We'll let you listen in those pipes as we drop the camcorder microphone in the pipe. You'll hear like a whining sound. This, we believe, connects to the underground. <clears throat> then we'll go to the overlook just west of the base and do a signal analysis of transmissions, radio transmissions, as received in August of 1993, coming off the state park, coming out of the old base. Then we'll go and look at the power lines going into the base, the east power line and the west power line. Then we'll show you all three backup power plants that are on the South Fork. There's a minor one in Montauk, there's a big one in East Hampton, and an even smaller one in South Hampton. These are plastic PVC pipes that come up through a stream which enters a culvert under the old Montauk Highway that now is a footpath. <clears throat> these pipes connect to something on the ground. We're now going to listen to these two pipes. We're now going to listen to the one on the east end. Now we're going to listen to the one on the west end. Listen. You should note there's a whistle sound on the base. as well as the seashell noise. Here we're looking at a digital data link that is coming off the base. This is Pulse FM. the bandwidth. The bandwidth right now is on 300 kilohertz. Here we have an apparent pilot tone which is used to synchronize the system. transmission, which is the ticks you are hearing, the clicks, is at the same frequency that the Montauk Project operated at, 420 to 460 megahertz. Here we're looking at the out-of-time signal. 
you notice a signal appears between the jumps. Each jump is a frame. This signal is the same type of modulation in the same frequency range that was used for the original Montauk project. It's still active and alive in August 15, 1993. We're looking at literally pieces of a thought form here, folks. This is pulse modulation, pulse amplitude, pulse phase, and pulse frequency. A frequency hops, as we saw on the spectrum display. What is a state park doing radiating this kind of signal? Both signals, the data link and the pulse transmission, was direction found to the old base. The data link appears to be coming off the red tower behind the security building, the white security building. The pulse transmission appears to be coming from south of the radar tower, possibly close to the area that had the particle accelerator in it. The actual line in this oscilloscope is very thin. The thickness is actually very small pulses containing lots and lots of information. This pulse modulation has nested modulation inside the pulse. There's a ton of information inside, especially this pulse right here. How you would generate this is with pulse control frequency, pulse control phase, and pulse patrol amplitude modulation. Today, this is probably done with direct digital synthesis on a computer. In the old days, it was computer controlling a phase frequency amplitude in the pulse mode modulators, as outlined in the original Montauk Project Experiments in Time book. Again, we can see we got a lot, a lot of information here. I suspect if you took these, lined them up side by side, it would form patterns, and those patterns somehow would be an optical representation, amplitude versus time, of the thought forms being transmitted. Now, the original transmission from the Montauk project was about 30 pulses a second, which was meant to interface with human beings. This transmission is at about one pulse per second, and it's meant to interface with a very slow consciousness to generate thought form very slowly. This could correlate with what the gentleman told me on the airplane in January of 95, that the Montauk Project was reading out the Akashic Record. The Akashic Record is part of the Earth's consciousness. So you would have to interrogate the Akashic Record very slow over a long period of time if you could do it manually, artificially, using technology. Of course, human consciousness has time compression, so we can access the Akashic Record and write into it very, very fast. We may be looking at data bits going into the Akashic Record after the plasmoid is erased and then rewritten. This may be the actual data. So we may be looking at a raw, basic thought form here. I don't know. Because I don't know how much what the gentleman told me on the airplane, the claim to be the director of the existing Montauk project, how much of it was all science fiction, I don't know. Doesn't matter. Now watch these pulses. Steady signal. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in the pulses. See those pulses up here? Yes. They're in between the two big pulses at the left side of the screen and about a third in from the right side of the screen. Those pulses are stationary. You're looking at the pulses that come and go. This is from a geophone, which is a coil in a magnetic field, shielded. This is sitting on the ground, connected directly to the input of the oscilloscope. This is picking up the output of the Delta T antenna. So they're doing the exact same thing they did years ago in the Montauk project, 
pulse modulating a UHF signal and also pulse modulating the Delta T antenna. See, we see the pulse is on either side of the right-hand main pulse. Now it's on the left side of the right-hand main pulse. The right side of the screen is 9.41 p.m. on it. If you look closely at the wider pulses, you'll see they resemble the pulses that we saw on the scope from the pulse transmission. This is very interesting, folks. This is saying that the Montauk Project is still on the air, August 15, 1993. Here we have a clear signal with no pulses on it, so you see what a clear signal looked like. Then you'll see the pulses appear back. It's pretty bizarre that they're still running it from a state park. Uh -huh. Yep. The state park still has a major active underground facility that goes down eight levels. It's like an underground city. We have our own Area 51 here on Long Island, folks. Look at the number of pulses here and the width of some of them. This definitely resembles. Now we're looking at a power line out at Montauk. The interesting thing about this power line is you can see the telephone pole is new. It's not a creosoted telephone pole. This is within the last 10 years. Also, there's five wires. Normally there's three. They put two more wires between them getting ready to switch from the old wiring to the new wiring. This is standard operating procedure for the power company. Note how nice and new the telephone pole is. Someone maintains this facility quite regularly for the power. There's Peter Moon, his back. Here we're looking at the terminus end where it comes up from underground. Here we see some of the new insulators and some of the new fuse holders and lightning arrestors that they're putting on these lines. As we can see here, these lines are being totally rebuilt replace a hundred percent. You can see the new lines which are in between the old lines are actually heavier. They're thicker, much thicker. The right hand side of the screen, the left hand side of the screen that's the old line which is thin and the new line is much thicker. Look like stringing some new wires. Here we actually have Loco doing their thing on the base. They're actually doing their thing here. We see them in process of actually stringing a new wire. This is the other end of the wire they're stringing. If somebody tells us they're not maintaining this power line because it's an old power line they're not using, here's proof that they're maintaining it, folks. Now we're behind the base coming in from the west end. And we can see here that they actually tore out the brush around the old power line. And they're in the process of rebuilding this power line. They're increasing the voltage. These power lines have smaller insulators. There we see they actually replaced the pole. Now we're looking at the new
fuse structure, the new fuse holders for the power line. This line ends up at the white building. All this power is going into one white building. Just as all the power from the other line goes into the maintenance shed, the green maintenance garage. Here we have the Montauk power plant. This plant is on the back end of Fort Pond. You think these are diesel engines we're looking at, but there's no service access for the diesel engines. I'm told these are cooling towers in management, fuel management systems for the turbines that are underground. They use a Carnot cycle turbine, which is almost a free energy device. Those stacks are the wrong kind of stacks for a diesel uh, engine, I'm told. By a diesel mechanic. He's never seen engines like these. The one in the back is an engine. You can see the service ports on it. It has a whole different stack. Again, this is camouflage, so the local people think it's just a backup power plant. Now, we had an associate that worked at Long Island Lighting Company look up Montauk 9U on his computer. And it came up, everything is classified, but he was able to find out that this can produce 100 megawatts and it's not connected to the grid. This is backup power, supposedly, is what the town people believe. Now we're looking at the phase correcting capacitors. Now listen. Hear that hum? These big transformers, which are probably hundreds of megawatts each, these big transformers are humming. These things only hum when they're under load. This is a backup power plant. Why is it under load present time when there's no backup power needed? Listen to the way this thing is humming. This is having a lot of power drawn through it right this minute as we're watching it. Each one of these transformers, I'm told, is capable of about 30 to 50 megawatts of power. Montauk 9U. Here we're looking at the line that comes off the power plant. Here we're looking at two lines that go underground from this plant. And when we go across the street, we see it does sort of connect into the power grid, but not completely. But here we have a third power line that goes underground. Now from here, we're going to go to East Hampton, the south side of the railroad tracks in the west end of town. We're going to see another backup power plant, supposedly backup power for the town of East Hampton. Look at the size of that oil tank, folks. This thing must use a lot, a lot of fuel. They got multiple oil tanks. Half a, th half a million gallons. Now here we see another cooling tower for turbines underground. And as we go over here, the turbine is right under this facility. We see some maintenance buildings for the turbine. It probably goes underground through that building. Now here we see the vertical silver, what looks like pipes, inside all the electrical stuff. That's the actual conductor. They got huge amounts of power going through this and it's totally underground. Here we have the executive producer of this videotape. This is Kitty who put up all the money to produce this videotape. Here we're looking at a definite diesel generator in the town of Southampton. No question, this is a diesel system. This is probably backup power used to start the other two generator stations.
Again, we note another huge oil tank. Also, we see the maintenance ports to service the big engine. You use a small engine to start the bigger engine. Here we have a federal type alarm box that's typical of federal installations. 127,003 gallons number two fuel oil. Well, I'd like to have that to run my kerosene heaters. Here we had this rectangular sign which is typical of federal facilities. Code numbers. I like this building that has the toilet sitting out in front of it. Here we're looking at the interface between the cooling tower and the uh, diesel generator. There may be another turbine underground here, we really don't know. Now, if this isn't bizarre enough, seeing the proof of the base still being active, although it is a state park, we will now go and show you the Cardion radar that appeared in 1994 on the bluffs overlooking the ocean on the south side of the Montauk Fork. The interesting thing to note about this, this is not standard radar as it was not easily detected in the parking lot a mile away. Actually, it's less than a mile away and it created odd interference with camcorder which was later deduced and traced to a particle beam type interference instead of electromagnetic wave, which as out of the pyramids of Montauk is believed to be the next step in mind control. Now if this is not advanced bizarre enough, we'll go and show you the evidence we have for particle accelerators out at Montauk. One being on the base and then the second one being under the traffic circle in the center of town. Then from there we're going to go and show you aerial shots. Number of airplane flights were taken over the Montauk base and hence we gathered some aerial footage. From that arose the mystery of the Montauk bottle where we saw this bottle on the roof of one of the little buildings from the air but did not see it from the ground and then the bottle appeared in my house later, as explained in the narrations. This is the new radar that appeared in 1994 on the bluffs overlooking the ocean and the Montauk Air Force Base State Park. The Cardion Corporation put this radar here at four hours away from their plant when they could have used state lands or a half an hour away from their plant. Why do they travel four hours? That's a good question. This radar literally tore apart when you were looking at the generator, the picture in the viewfinder. Note, we can't focus the thing. Listen carefully here, zip, that's the sound. trouble we have focusing and note the sound a quantum nuclear physicist friend of mine told me that a particle beam as it comes out the aperture ionizes the air and creates near infrared which would foul up the focusing of the camera we'll have to tell them radar. and also that the uh, particle beam would interfere with the electron beam since the electron beam is also particulate. Now as you look in this reflector you'll see like a beam of light reflecting off the back of the reflector. You look carefully you'll see it coming out of the gain horn. This is an air infrared being bounced off the reflector. Now the sound I had to determine whether it was coming in through the audio amplifiers in the camcorder or the microphone. If it's coming in the audio amp, so it would saturate the transistors and cause a Miller effect phase modulation of the background audio. I looked for that with a Hewlett Packard 5420 phase frequency amplitude analyzer and saw no phase shift in the background. So this was not saturated amplifiers that made the sound the particle beam was actually jiggling the microphone diaphragm. Again, we can see the flashlight effect, which is an air infrared that was focused, was showing or throwing off the autofocus on my camera. 
At this point, the autofocus is shut off. I finally realized what was happening. Now, slow motion, look very carefully at the white rectangle that's on the arm that comes out from the front of the antenna. You'll see like streaks and glows and, and detail and fuzz in front of that white section, between the white section and the antenna. This is the actual near infrared. You can see it there. And you'll see multiple reflections in the reflector of near infrared because there's multiple angles coming out of the particle beam aperture, which is where the gain horn would be. The particle beam is generated by a crystal structure using a microwave signal that strips off the electrons from hydrogen gas, which then becomes a proton beam. And the proton beam comes out like an electromagnetic wave. The proton beam is a virtual particle beam. According to Duncan Cameron's channeled sources, this beam can interrogate the synaptic interchanges of the brain. Here we have birds lined up like little soldiers. This reminds me of Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. The second read that Duncan Cameron came up with said that the particle beam, if you modulated it right, you could actually control the synaptic interchanges. This is the next level of mind control, folks, since you don't need a psychic signature. Anyone within range would be rather controlled. Maybe you hit the sign over here. Going around, very good shape. Boo! As I make a noise, the birds don't fly away. These birds are stunned. Now we're looking at birds caught in possibly a vortex structure created by the Cardion radar. I'm told by Autobahn Society people that these birds don't do this circling number or line up on wires. This is abnormal for these birds. They appear to be caught in something. It's not a thermo because there was a fairly good wind this day. And the wind would blow the thermals away. When the birds were lined up on the wire, that was another day where it was absolutely calm. Here we're looking at slow motion. You can see some of the birds are going one way and the other birds are going the opposite way. This is allowing you to study the motion of the birds. Now here we're looking at the hill, which is from one of the underground bunkers out at Montauk Point. This is left over from the old artillery forts. We don't believe this was used in the Montauk project, but we really don't know for sure. The Montauk boys were processed in a bunker quite similar to this one on the Montauk base. Again, we're seeing the birds. And we can watch the way they move. This is pretty bizarre, folks. This is bizarre behavior for these birds. Now we're looking at a second taping of a group of birds that were circling on the same site. There we see the Coast Guard beacon antenna. That transmits a 300 kilohertz signal at 10 watts. But when you look at Montauk Tour number one, you look at the insulators and wonder. Now here we can actually see what's going on with these birds. We can see they're excited and whipped up into a frenzy over something. We can really see here that they're circling. Because some are going in one direction, the other are going opposite. And the ones don't appear to move at all. They're probably moving towards or away from us. These birds are actually caught in some sort of vortex, it's believed. Now here we're seeing direct evidence for the particle accelerator. 
Off the left hand side comes the beam port. The center has the maintenance port. The bottom of the picture has the particle entry port. And then we see cooling pools around the particle accelerator. Here we can see the cooling pools in the L-shaped cryogenic buildings. A friend of mine who's a quantum physicist identified this matching exactly a particle accelerator of the circular kind. He showed me diagrams for it that match this picture exactly. This has been identified by other scientists as a particle accelerator. Now folks, what's a particle accelerator doing out of Montauk? Considering this could be used as a final amplifier, here is the million megawatts of power as gotten from uh, mathematic conversion charts and physics conversion charts that the psychics told me they had a million megawatts of power. And I used to say, what kind of grass are you smoking? Now this is a possible source. And they just happen to have an entry in the charts for a 625 foot circle, which this one is here. Here we're looking at a particle beam target. It's believed this came out of the Montauk Underground. It would not make sense to transport this from Brookhaven Lab in Yapank to uh, East Hampton. We contacted the scrap metal company whose truck this was on, and they said it came out of the Brand Farron Stage Prop Studio. Now, my quantum physicist friend identified these as very expensive vacuum flanges selling for about 10 grand a piece. If this was a stage prop, they could have used steam flanges that would look very, very similar, but sold for $100 a piece. You don't build a stage prop with $10,000 flanges that could be reused, could be replaced by a $100 flange. This is not a stage prop, folks. It may now be a stage prop, but this was built as an actual high vacuum system with particle detectors, I'm told. This is a typical particle beam detector used in a particle accelerator, and most likely it came out of the Montauk base underground. Here we're looking at aerial shots of the old Montauk Air Force Station. Here we have the security building with the red and white tower behind it. Mike Ash reported walking over a dirt field to go into the side of what I believe was this building. But this originally had a parking lot. But we can see here the parking lot has been torn up. So Mike had to have had knowledge of the base and he recalled under hypnosis walking across a dirt field into a set of double doors. Here we're looking at the bunker which Junior was sighted over on Montauk Tour number one. Junior would be right in the middle towards the right side of the round thing. We notice we look there, we see sort of a fuzzy area. This is the exact same angle, and we see a fuzzy indescript thing there. You have to be at the right angle to see Junior on the cameras. Here we're looking at the Montauk Air Force Base from the air once again. The picture has been enhanced to bring up the contrast so you can see all the individual buildings, how they're laid out in the roads. I could have made this softer so you'd see all the trees, but we're interested here in the buildings. This is what the base looked like before they started a cleanup contract where they were cleaning up PCB oils. And asbestos. They tore down buildings supposedly because there was asbestos in them but they did not take the asbestos covered pipes down that run all around the base. A friend of mine assured me that the federal EPA, and this was an Army Corps of Engineers project, requires anyone approaches soft asbestos not glued into a structure have to be suited because as the wind goes over, asbestos might be blown off and it's considered very dangerous. Here we're looking at the satellite link for the town of East Hampton Communications Facility, which is in the garbage dump just west of Montauk. Now we're looking at the top of Radar Hill. What do we note? The old power plant is torn out. And what is behind the old power plant? This huge hole. 
which appears to have a mudslide going down the hill where the hole is on the top of the hill. More on that later. Note the white pipes that are on the sticks that went to the old power plant. When they demolished buildings, they just laid the pipes on the ground. Here is the security building, but they've done more work. They dug something out of the back end of the security building. It might have been an oil tank, but who knows for sure. It might have been also an entrance to the underground or an emergency exit, which they're blocking off so that no one can use the Army Corps of Engineer maps and gain entrance to the underground. Here we see the hole behind the power plant and apparently the mud that ran down the side of the hill. The story behind this hole is this was made in an underground accident when the underground partly filled with water after they closed the watertight doors. It crashed up through the different floors of the underground until it cracked the roof and came bubbling up out of the ground and made this hole. This would explain the mud that apparently ran down the side of the hole. Mike Ash once again reported diving in the Montauk Underground. Here we can see the major mudslides that went down the hill. If that was erosion, there'd be a rut worn in the hill, but it isn't. You can see that is actually built up. Here we're looking in the top of the hole. A friend of mine that does construction work and operates bulldozers and big machines says this hole was not made by a machine. The only time he's seen a hole similar to this is when they broke a pipe and the water came bubbling up out of the ground. The water bubbled up and made this kind of a hole. Now the hole is dry. We can see definite mud pack that went down the side of the hill. We see the trees partially buried in the mud. Now we're looking at the roof of the underground and we can see cement structures all through this. We can see the actual crack that still has water in it. On uh, June 23rd, 1994, they had not pumped out the water. Again, we see the asbestos covered pipes. Even to this day, those pipes are still out there. Again, we see more mudslide as it came down the edge of the hill from this. Here we're looking at an apparent thing that connects to the top of the underground. Here we're looking at the bottom of the hole and we see definite cement structures down at the bottom of the hole. Now we're looking at present day when they filled in the power plant left the hole and left the pipes. Now look at the rectangular black roof about in the center of the screen. There's a smokestack next to that roof. Now we see the old steam plant torn down, but they left the smokestack. My friend that does the demolition and construction work says the first thing you do is you take the smokestack down so it doesn't fall on you as you're demolishing the building. This here suggests they wanted to leave the smokestack because it's part of the underground facility, maybe a vent, or maybe a smokestack from some heaters from the underground. You can see different levels of the cleanup of the old steam plant. You can see here they dug down and dug something out from underground. Now it's all buried over and the smokestack is gone. We exposed the smokestack so they had to tear it down. We called their bluff and they tore it down. Now we're looking at the planetary grid cross point. Note how it looks now, including the roads and the parking lots. Now we see another shot of the planetary grid cross point in 94 where we see they took up a parking lot. The parking lot is actually torn up. Why? We don't know. And we can see the actual grid cross point has no more grass or trees in the middle of it like it did before. Some people we know wanted a sample of that tree, but they took it out before we could get it. Now we're looking at what the cross point looks like now, and we see the parking lot is partially restored, but not completely. Here we're looking at present day aerial shots of the point of the Montauk Air Force Base. We can see they've done quite a bit of work, but that hole is still there. 
they never filled in that hole. This was done in uh, February of 1995, this shot. Supposedly, the reconstruction job is done. The cleanup is done. Now we're looking at one of the Montauk closets that's involved in the Montauk mystery bottle. From the air, we saw this curious building. Now you can see something silver and round on the top next to a rectangular gray thing. This is pretty much what the building looked like, except for the round thing. When we visited this building on the ground, all three of us saw a round wine bottle. It did not photograph. That's very strange, folks. More on that a little later. All of a sudden, I lost it in the viewfinder. I kept the camera on this for quite a while. It was hard because the plane was moving and I was zoomed in. Now we've lost a building. No, we haven't lost a building. We're a little bit closer now. Now we've lost a building. I'm scanning all around. I can't find the building in the viewfinder. I look down, now I find the building. Now note, there's now a black thing next to the gray rectangular thing on the roof. Watch what happens. Watch what the black thing does, folks. There, see it? Something opened on the top. We'll play it again, Sam, a number of times. Play it again, Sam. There it goes. Something opens. This, of course, piqued our curiosity. This is why a week later, after this shot was made, we encountered and we mounted an expedition to go out, find this building, and see what opened on the roof. Something actually opened. It opens within a frame. One frame, nothing. Next frame, the lid is open. And then the next frame, the lid is closed. Each frame is a thirtieth of a second, folks. And we can see this black thing is actually higher than the gray cover. There it opens again. What gives, folks? What the heck? I don't know what we're looking at. That's why we mounted the expedition. We took chances and entered what we told was a closed area, but we entered by ways where we saw no signs. We gambled, we didn't get caught, and we got these tapes. What, what gives, folks? I don't know what that is. You can see the silver spot is still there. Now we're looking at a close-up. This is made using a black and white monitor with the camera on the monitor. Huh? What's that? There it is again, folks. You can see there's something sitting up off the roof that has a lid that opens. What is this, folks? I don't know. Why did the building appear? You know, why did the building have nothing on the roof? The building disappeared and then it came back with this thing on the roof. This definitely got our curiosity. This got us going. What the heck, folks? There's other words I use I can't say here. But what the heck is this? I don't know. I wish I really knew. Fade the black. Now we're going to look at later shots of the building from the air. Again, we see there's something on the roof. Some sort of a box that's closed. Now we're beginning to see a lid on the box. What is this, folks? I don't know. We don't see anything from the ground that even resembles this. You see there's definitely a box up on the roof next to the gray rectangular cover. And you'll see why it's a cover when we show you the ground shots. 
Of course we're going to show you ground shots. We can see here the depth of the box. Now, what's interesting to note is the boxes here, as we zoom in, what we'll see is the box is now open. We can see the box is open and the lid is now over the side of the building. See the box with the open lid. What is this, folks? I don't know. You can see there's definitely a box there with the lid open. Peter Moon laughingly suggested, is this Jack Parsons' magic box? We see something very strange, possibly extra dimensional here, that photographs only from the air. When you view it from the ground, it's not there. What the heck, folks? I don't know. This is peculiar to me. This is very strange. Some people suggest that the possibly the building dropped down in the ground and another building comes up. There's no evidence of that on site. What it appears is there's multiple versions and multiple realities of this building. I wondered if something came up from the ground, up through the building, up through the roof. Again, there's no evidence of that either. The ground and the junk debris on the floor of the building is such that that's precluded. I look for signs that the building would sink and another one would come up. Although it's bizarrely complex, who knows. Now we're looking at the building present day air shots and we're now seeing what the building looks like from the ground but from the air. We see some boards to one side of the gray cover and we see just a black area of the roof and we see none of it really sticks above the roof by much but in other shots there's some sort of machine that has a lid that opens and at times there's a box that's on the roof So from the air, we can get the actual correct shot of the building that we encounter on the ground at some times. But not all the time, folks. There's something very strange about this point here at the Montauk Air Force Station. Now, we mounted an expedition, went out. All three of us saw this bottle, a bottle that looked like this, on the roof of that building. Then the next day, we looked at it on a Wednesday out at Montauk. Thursday morning, this bottle appeared out in the back room of my house. We see it has a serpent on it. Is that a message, folks? And Vipessa is the brand name. Now we're approaching the building. We can see it's a cinder block structure, like many of the Montauk closets pictured in Montauk Revisited. It has a window, nothing unusual. There's a cinder block walls. It has a couple of power boxes in it. When we look at the roof, no one's going to stand on that roof. They'll fall through that roof. That roof is ready to come apart. Now there's the steel lid that covers this huge hole. This is the gray rectangle you see from the roof. Again, you can see the roof is ready to come apart. There's Peter Moon climbing up on the roof. Since he's the lightest, he went up. He reported he almost fell through. He had to step on the boards that were placed up there. Curiously enough, there was a ladder left there for us to climb up on the roof. Do you see a bottle, folks? We're looking at the roof right now. No. No sign of a bottle 
on the video, but all three of us saw that bottle on the roof. Myself and the other two fellows identified that bottle as being looking like the one on the roof. Psychics say that this was a message to Preston, look what we can do. Here, we're attempting to simulate the thing that opens. No way is that big massive piece of steel going to move in a thirtieth of a second. That does not account for the thing to open. Also, we saw the open thing next to the lid. This will be a mystery for a long, long time, folks. I don't know what the solution to the mystery is. This the material from Montauk, but added on to this tape is some studies I did down in Atlanta, Georgia, in Orlando, Florida, at Albilex House in Atlanta, and at the house of uh, friends in Orlando, Florida. This will show some active mind control transmissions being put on these houses to affect the individuals. This is put on for your understanding, so if it happens to you, you have some idea of what is going on. Sample 60 hertz, but remember, a video type signal is based upon 60 hertz.
corner of the now house before. Starting to hear the signal again. Hear it coming out of the receiver. Now it's beep. Now come go to the corner. Now notice. It's picking up slightly. Now the peak comes away. It disappears. Look at that. Yeah. Face me when we do this. Alright. That's right, sure. Yeah.
You can hear it coming through the receiver. The big, the high pitch whistle is from the camera. Now pull away. You know, it's, it's gone. It's gone. It's right in the house. It's in the house. There we walk by the telephone lines. It's not the power. She pick it up. You should pick it up real strong to hold the power. It's not coming in the power lines. You pick it up slightly on the phone lines. Now we're inside this carport. We don't pick it up. It's not on the power line of the house. Because we hear it on that light up there, right? which we didn't. Now we get close to the door, you can start to hear it. Hear it in there? We don't hear it. Yeah, hear it? In Pete's house, it's in his half of the house more than the other half of the house. Okay. <laughs> now it's starting to pick it up. Pete looks pretty upset here, folks, right? Well, he's the owner and he has to live here he's with Al Beer. Getting stronger. We're down in Orlando, Florida. And our associate here, Jim, is reporting that he has a signal that comes in at about 2 o'clock in the morning that causes him distress. He can feel like a pulsing of it. So we came, brought the equipment over here, the Watkin Johnson's receiver set up, and we searched around. Like in Atlanta, we're picking up a video-like signal in the lower HF regions. It appears to repeat every 200 kilohertz. But if you look at it carefully, between FM detectors, AM detectors, wideband, narrowband, you'll see it's a signal sweeping back and forth very fast. It's not power line related, because we tried the oscilloscope on power line sync, and it won't sync at all on the signal. So it's not a signal coming out of the power line. It's not like an arc going to a tree or something like that in a local area, or something arcing in uh, Jim's house here. This is a transmitted signal that's swept. Now, three and a half megahertz is still there, but it's weak. You can still see it in the scope display. Four and a half megahertz. Five, four point nine megahertz. Right, that's four point seven. You can see it's still there. You can hear it. You can see it at 5.1. Okay. It's going above 5 megahertz. 8 to 9 megahertz. Like in Atlanta, Georgia. You can see, as you tune the receiver, you're going through the S curve, and you can see it's a frequency sweep. It seems to be centered at 1.85 megahertz. This is some sort of broad spectrum communication. This grass is the noise on the HF band. You see, all in here, you can see it as you tune it through the FM. Two or three megahertz of bandwidth. Now let's let's now go 
throw back the 400 and let's spread it. Let's see if it changes. If it's video, like leaking out of somebody's video recorder. Let's go to FM like a video recorder. Let's see how constant it is. That's a constant signal. That's not video. Because if it was a TV program, we'd be seeing changes in here. So this is not a video leakage from a VCR or a TV set. AM. We can see it has different information nested in the amplitude versus the frequency domain. I am sweeping here. Formation. major turning point at 2 megahertz even. This is in the amplitude domain. 1.8 is another turning point. Now we're getting AM broadcast information coming in. Now let's look at FM. Now FM's even more interesting. We're going through a number of vestige carriers, vestigial carriers. We're going to go up to 3 megahertz and go down. You'll see we're going through a number of vestigial carriers. This is where the frequency goes and jumps around to different frequency spec different frequency portions. coming in. And out here it's 
score. We get close. They're starting to come in. See? It's coming in nice now. It was interesting to notice the plant shielded out. That's very interesting to note. Okay, shut it off. Let's go in. Lighter signal. Say it in the camera. <laughs> Sorry, it feels like a lighter signal here. Now go inside. This, this spot right here is, is stronger than down there. I feel this a lot more at this point. Okay, what's the effect it's having on you? They are uh, to here. A lot more tingling sensation, okay. uh, sort of like chills running down the body. Yeah, let's start here. here. You see them? Can you see it? You got it. That's what I'm getting here. And yeah, this is not this this is, is is a light tingling sensation, not quite as as strong as back there in the room. Yeah, this okay, is okay. Let's check them. And you going back and forth with the uh, equipment. When I was standing back there, I was getting really nauseous, uh, like uh, I wanted to vomit. And the longer I stayed in the more I got, and you know, I don't, I'm sweating like a pig. So there's something definitely back in that room. Okay, what we have here is direct correlation of two gentlemen comparing a strong signal area and a weak signal area. It's definitely going to have psychological effects. We're seeing it, and Jim here was getting movement of his skin apparently. Yeah, yeah you can see the goosebumps up yeah. on the skin. Yeah, great. And mine was, I mean, you know, right now I'm getting it again, and it's, I don't know if you've got anything on to feel it, but it's almost like, I don't know how to describe it. When I was in the Air Force, when you stood in front of an active radar, you could feel the warm feeling mm -hmm. going through you. That's what I'm feeling uh -huh. right now, the warm feeling going back and forth. It's almost like left to right. It's, mm -hmm. it's like this. It's a wave. Now we're at Ed's house. Now we're 20 kilohertz bandwidth. The fellow in the red shirt.
Now, definitely, the signal at Jim's house that resembles video, as we can see, is definitely not video. Now we go to Ed's house, and we pick up a signal I haven't picked up in over eight years. This signal appears to frequency hop all over the HF region between 4 and 24 megahertz. It is called over the horizon radar. The government told me this is the same thing as a Russian woodpecker, which is known to be psychoactive. These waveforms we're looking at, where this is the sync pulse, this synchronizes the brain wave. This entrains the brain wave. Then, when the brain wave is entrained, they then transmit a waveform that has information. This, I'm told, looks like brain activity by a brain expert. This, I'm told, looks exactly like brain activity where you get on a high frequency uh, encephalograph. We see a slope with a lot of jagged edges on it. The jagged edges are the higher frequency information carried by the lower frequency, especially here. These appear to be coming from five transmitters spaced around the country. And it doesn't stay at one spot for any length of time. Up until this point, between now and eight years ago, I only would pick up this occasionally in the HF band. You hear one blast and then it would be gone. And you wouldn't hear it for the rest of the evening that you scanned. But at Ed's house, I was picking it up almost constantly. It was very easy to find. This is a very bizarre signal. Very, very complex. I'm told this signal also is direct digitally generated. This signal comes right out of the computer into the power amps. Some of the transmitters are 10 kilowatts and some of them are 100 kilowatt transmitters. Now we're looking at an aerial flight over the village of Montauk. We're now over the center of town. We see the apartment building, the apartment tower. That tower reportedly is government owned since the Navy paid for the brick face on it when it was refurbished. Here we're looking at the traffic circle which was rebuilt sometime in the 60s. Again, my quantum physicist friend identifies this as this might be a particle accelerator. Remember, particle accelerators typically come in threes. At the Montauk installation, the big one is a LINAC in Fort Pond Bay. This is the next biggest one, and then the small one is on the base. They started out accelerating in the b big one, then dumped to the smaller one, then dumped to the smallest one. And then the smallest one is when they reach the speed of light. Here we're just looking at some of the countryside at Montauk. We can see these people have quite a metaphysical awareness. Here's Stonehenge. This is a condo that sort of resembles Stonehenge. This is a very esoteric design. We can see some of the posh houses here at Montauk. Now we're looking at Council Rock, which was placed on sacred Indian soil. This is some of the Indian burial grounds. They tried to build condos here, and the different machines would not function. They would malfunction. People were injured here. This is definitely a very sacred site. This is where I slipped and fell because I scoffed Council Rock and made a joke about it. Once again, I apologize to the Indian spirits. Here we can see some of the water leading to Lake Montauk. And we can see the bay that's in between the North and the South Fork, in between Montauk Point and Orient Point. There's the power plant. 
a bird's eye view of the power plant. This is the Marine Research Institute at Montauk. We can see some of the posh condos again. And some of the houses just by themselves in the woods. This is a very expensive posh area. Well folks, thanks for watching the videotape, putting up with my madness. Watch for videotape number three to come out probably sometime in 1995. Thank you and bye bye.